as the dust continues to settle. Penn State is looking for some more players out of the transfer portal as players are already moving around and Penn State's got to readjust its focus. We're talking about realistic options and maybe some unrealistic options as Penn State navigates the transfer portal. And we discuss it here on another live Locked On Nittany Lions. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That is right. You are locked on Nittany Lions. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Zach Seiko, bringing you all things Penn State Nittany Lions. Today's episode is brought to you by Team Ticker, the high-tech sports sign with a retro look. Show your team pride and go to teamticker.com and enter code Locked On to get $50 off your online order this holiday season. We welcome him back, Pat Korbler. Korbler on X, Black Shoe Diaries writer, onto the show to talk all things transfer portal here as the priority targets, maybe some guys that are more long shot contenders in this case, but can Penn State possibly sway them to come to Happy Valley before we discuss any of it? Help out the channel. Subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lions on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Join the discussion. Be active in the comments section. Let us know what players you want to see as. The dust has settled, but names can go in and out at any point in time. We've already seen some Penn State targets make decisions, like a Penn State commits older brother decides to go to Notre Dame, interestingly enough. Pat, it, it's great to have you back on to discuss all of these things. Just a great time in the... Oh, I'm, oh, I'm back. Okay. I thought it was muted for a second. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back on. Transfer portal time is uh, great this time of year, and... Uh, yeah, excited to uh, talk about everyone that's jumped in. I do enjoy the you know the lead up to transfer portal because in that week you have people, you know, making their announcements that they're going to enter, and then the day of comes and Penn State fans start screaming about why we haven't landed anyone yet. So uh, always enjoyable that this lasts for thirty days, and on day one you have uh, fans, not just Penn State fans, but fans of all colleges being like, okay, when are kids going to commit? So it takes a little bit of time, but thank you as always for having me on, Zach. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're committed to this show, which I which I really appreciate. Uh, so let's see what players could actually commit to Penn State in this case. We'll start with the priority targets, guys that Penn State either has had an ongoing recruiting re- relationship back to when these players were in high school, guys that they've offered. One of them is the Indiana wide receiver, Donovan McCauley. It, it seems like Penn State, uh, Penn State's top target, at least in this point, and he has reported that he's received an offer from the Nittany Lions since being in the transfer portal. We'll discuss another Indiana counterpart too right after him. But your thoughts on McCauley? Big fan of McCauley's game. Um, he was a quarterback in high school, and I think we talked about him on our last podcast. Quarterback yep. in high school was highly touted kid himself. Was a four-star, so certainly wasn't just like, oh, you know, just a random kid that went to Indiana. He was, you know, pretty talented, um, uh, Played quarterback his first season in Indiana, then made the switch to wide receiver, 6'5", you know, 200 pounds. Uh, once again, he's the kid who had the 69-yard touchdown against Penn State earlier this year yeah. when they didn't have anyone yeah. covering him. I did see a clip that he hit 20.3 miles per hour on that on that route, which is, uh, like, decently fast. It's not, you know, Tyreek Hill and those guys get, like, 22, 23. So uh, for being 6'5 and, and being on the bigger end, you know, 200, 210 pounds, uh, pretty good speed. Um, still, you know, I, I think what's interesting about him compared to, you know, we will get to like Julian Fleming in a little bit, I'm sure. Yep. What's interesting about him compared to like a Fleming is that he's much younger. Julian Fleming, I believe is 22 turning 23. Um, and Macaulay, I believe is only, you know, 20 years old. So when you think about like his growth potential compared to some other kids, cause he's not, you know, a, a graduate transfer or he might be a graduate transfer, but um, certainly on the younger end of, of things. So I just think, you know, you, you like a little bit of upside knowing that yes, whoever comes in, you do want them to contribute right away and be good right away. But that idea of that, they haven't, you know, hit their peak and that they're haven't, haven't plateaued, which 
once again, we'll talk about Fleming in a little bit, but I think can be a bit of a concern when it comes to him and just some other guys that are, you know, playing in their fifth, sixth, and in some cases, even seventh year of, of college football that can they get much better and, and is this it? So McCauley has that growth upside. So yeah, a lot to like there. And and he's been drawing quite a few offers, you know, Michigan, Nebraska, South Carolina. So it will not be an easy target for, for Penn State to get, but good so far. No, and, I, and I'd lump him in with Josh Kelly as well. Now, Kelly different. I mean, like night and day here, right? You have McCauley who's six foot five, and then you have Josh Kelly who's the five foot nine, more comparable to a KJ Hamler type. And McCauley, I mean, Allen Robinson was six. You're thinking three, but... Jalen Lucas, not Josh Kelly. Josh Kelly is the Washington. Well, both, and I, oh yeah, I was gonna get, I was gonna get to. I'm turn in terms of who they've offered as well. Oh, no, gotcha. I know yeah. Jalen Lucas. Yeah, but I'm saying the wide receivers at the at the Power Five spot because my my point about this being Pat is I appreciate you making sure that I didn't mess that up. But uh, no, um, no okay. Jalen Lucas more of the 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 specialist type. But I know we're, we'll get to him in a second. But what, I, what I'm referring back to is the fact that Penn State always seems to get the Group 5 transfer. Dante Cephas, Mitchell Tinsley. Malik McLean was supposed to be that exception, right? He, he was supposed to be the uh, Power 5 wide receiver that just didn't have enough opportunities. And, yeah. and there's clearly why he fell down on the depth chart at Florida State because Florida State's roster was not that good when he was there. Then they brought in a bunch of other receiver recruits, commits out of the transfer portal, and it's no wonder his snaps went down because there were just better players in front of him. And we're kind of seeing the case of that still at Penn State. But I think my biggest gripe here is that Penn State, I don't want to say settles, but I, I'm tired of them getting the group five transfers. They really need to go after the power five players. So that's why I included Josh Kelly out of Washington State, Donovan McCauley, Jalen Lucas, who we'll get to in just a second here, of players who have not only played college football for a while, but power five college football and big 10 football at that. So my priorities and Penn state should be as well is getting two guys who at least one of them who are not only familiar with the level of talent, but just the familiarity of the landscape. I mean, coming out of the big 10 is crucial as well. If you can get them to stay in conference like that. Yeah, no, I, th I think, you know, ideally when you're looking at the transfer portal, you want to take guys that, you know, have proven it on some level. And obviously when you have group of five versus power five, which by the way, what are we calling power five now? Considering that the PAC 12, you know, isn't around oh, yeah. anymore. And big 12 power, kind of big, like power four and a half. I don't know. Or yeah. two, like two and a half big 10 ICC ACC is like the half big 12. What, what are they yeah. anymore? So that's, yeah. you know, point for another day, but I was you know <laughs> writing something and I was like, mm, power fives aren't like a real thing anymore. But yeah. uh, to, to your point though, right. Somebody that proven it, you know, at least for this season at the power five level, you know, in the pac 12 or the big 12. Um, yep. The unfortunate thing is those types of guys that are, you know, productive at that level, you know, can be on the pricier side with, you know, NIL things. And and we're seeing yep. lots of different guys. I'm not saying, you know, necessarily, you know, Don, Donovan McCauley or these other guys are just simply looking for, you know, the highest payment, which if they are, I mean, by all means, I, I think that's what a lot of us do in just our day to day lives. So how can we look down on a college kid? that's, you know, trying to do the same thing, but you know, those are the ones that the best teams are going after. And, and yes, Penn state is a top 10 team and, you know, on the brink of college football playoff contention and hopefully next year we'll be in it. But when you compare them to, you know, a place like Oregon or Washington or even Georgia, where they, you know, have had a little bit more success when it comes to wide receiver. I think that, you know, in, in Penn state's benefit, they didn't make that offense coordinator switch. So you can't, you know, take too much from, what has happened in past years, but on that same token, you're kind of taking a blind leap of faith. And yes, Andy, how do you pronounce his last name? Coddle Nicky, right? Coddle, Coddle Nicky. Coddle Nicky. Um, even though, right, he's proven it at Buffalo and at Kansas and, you know, even D3, he still has to prove at Penn State. So, yep. you know, it, it, even when you look at, you know, quarterbacks and stuff like that, that's why Drew and his progression and becoming a better quarterback is so important for Penn State because once Penn State can prove, once James Franklin can prove that quarterbacks can come to Penn State and they can be developed and they can go to the NFL, all mm -hmm. of a sudden that, you know, it opens everything up. The reason why Ohio State always gets really good quarterbacks, the reason why, you know, Oregon's in it for Cameron Ward and Washington's going to become a place that, you know, quarterbacks always look to. So, um, yeah, ideally Penn State gets these, you know, a power five proven wide receiver. Um, 
you know, it's just that that's of course what everybody wants. So it's, it's, you know, no, no easy pickings there. And I still feel like it, it's only a matter of time before Marcus Haggins is able to really put his best foot forward here. He's kind of dealing with the ramifications of the way the wide receiver room was left. Um, mm-hmm. it, 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 it was left without a, a sense of direction. And that's why I'm, I'm not here to just totally trash Taylor Stubblefield here, but there was a reason why he was fired. There was a reason why Mike Yursich was fired. There was the disconnect here. So Mar- <laughs> Marcus Haggins is now picking up the pieces with all of this. And he's going to reinvent the wide receiver room. We already saw Christian Driver put his name into the transfer portal. I anticipated some more wide receivers going in. But the way that Penn State likes to operate, they do these things day by day by day. So you saw some of those players go on the first day, and then Chop Robinson makes his announcement. It's actually been fairly quiet. I thought we'd kind of get another day. But maybe some of those players haven't had those decisions or maybe those winner, those after-season meetings are are wrapping up in this case. Let's get back to Jalen Lucas because we've mentioned him quite a bit. So him and Josh Kelly are are both smaller in stature, but Jalen Lucas is listed as a running back who could probably convert to wide receiver, something just more of a a specialty type of player. He's described as a specialist, right? Uh, Smaller, speedster, shifty. I I could see Penn State getting him. And I I think Penn State is kind of finished. I don't want to call it an experiment with Nicholas Singleton back at kick returner, but now... In his third season, there's more tread on the tires. Him and K. Tron Allen, I think the days of putting them in the return game are over just because you want to avoid injury, and that's why you go into the portal for things. Penn State utilizes the transfer portal to complement the program, right? This is a complementary piece. I like Jalen Lucas a lot because he fills a need that if you don't look too hard enough, if you it, it can go unnoticed if you're not looking for it. And I think Jalen Lucas is a need here if Penn State's able to land him. I think that, you know, he's one of the more, like you said, unique players in the portal because he's, you know, five foot nine, 170 pounds, but yet as this mm-hmm. is a running back, but yet has, you know, all the accolades as a kick returner. He, you know, he's been at Indiana two seasons, already has three kickoff returns for touchdowns. So, you know, just a dynamic guy with the ball in his hands. And I, and I think, you know, for Andy Kotelnicki, if he can get someone like that into his offense, and utilize them in different ways. I don't think anybody really expects, you know, Jalen Lucas to, whether he goes to Penn State, you know, obviously with Nick Singleton and Kane Tron Allen, it won't be the case. But even if he goes somewhere else where he's, you know, the running back depth chart room is, or is a little bit, you know, more open, he's not someone that's going to be carrying the ball 20 times a game just because he doesn't have the frame for it. Um, I think that he's, you know, just from my perspective, someone that's probably likely to make a transition to more of a mm-hmm. slot receiver role. Um, he did yeah. a little bit of that for Indiana, but was definitely more so, you know, lining up in the backfield. But even when he was doing that, he was very much a receiving threat, a receiving option. He had 34 catches this year, um, two touchdowns. So it was certainly involved in their passing game and and utilized that way. So I'm curious on him just because, right, we talked about in our last uh, podcast how a good way for people to understand who Penn State is going after without, you know, seeing who they offered or seeing when they're visiting is just simply by going to James Franklin's follower list or who he's following or going to, you know, whatever Penn state staff member and, and seeing who they have followed recently. Uh, Jalen Lucas entered this morning. Penn state has been following him for a couple of weeks now. So just put that in the back of your heads, because if we go back last year, this time before Dante Cephas had officially entered Penn state staff members were already following him. Um, So, I just wonder if right, I, we kind of started this at the beginning of the podcast with, uh, you know, Notre Dame lands Chris Mitchell, who is John Mitchell, yep. Penn State commits brother, you know, mm-hmm. right away. One would have to think that there might have been some, you know, talking prior to not necessarily with Chris himself, but with parents or with coaches or something mm-hmm. along those lines. And I do wonder if Jalen Lucas is somebody that Penn State kind of had an idea that would enter the portal. And now that he's officially in there, you know. Uh, Penn State was his first offer, the first offer that he tweeted out. He's only tweeted out Penn State and Arizona State so far, but Penn State was the first one. So um, as far as, you know, priority targets, I do think Mm -hmm. you follow kind of the follow the actions of the staff here. And it seems like Lucas is certainly somebody that Penn State wants to utilize within their offense and on special teams, like you said, uh, if they can land him. Well, and there's Kotal Nicky's influence right away is that Mm -hmm. because the way that Cody Nicky operates is it starts out horizontally 
And then that's how they attack you vertically by by exposing the safeties. But they want to spread defenses out as far as possible and opening up those lanes. And if you're going to get a, a player like a Jalen Lucas who can line up in the backfield, who can get in motion, who can shift around, you know what? How many players in Penn State's offense can can be that creative right now? I would like to think maybe a Caden Saunders could do that. But but is he ready to? Would would you be able to do that with Nicholas Singleton? Just get him. I feel like you could. I feel like Singleton's athletic enough and has gotten better with his pass catching where you could move him around and get creative with him in the backfield. I always like to use this analogy just because I feel like in basketball it's happened more often the last couple of years of mm-hmm. like this positionless game where you yeah. don't just have you know, a somebody who's just simply a power forward or someone who's just simply a shooting guard, right? You have combo guards, you have forwards. Of course, you're always still going to have room for just strictly centers, but right, you want to have guys that are interchangeable. And I feel like that is slowly now, it's not going to always fully happen in football because positions mm-hmm. are so specific at times. But you look at a team like the 49ers where they can have George Kittle, um, the fullback Kyle Juszczyk, Debo Samuel, um, Brandon Ayu, Chris McCaffrey. McCaffrey can line up at wide receiver. Kittle can line up in the backfield. Debo Samuel can play halfback, right? They can have all these different personnel groupings while not having to sum anyone out. Um, that's much easier said than done because getting a Debo Samuel, getting a Christian McCaffrey who can line up at wide receiver and play running back or getting a Kyle Juszczyk who can you know, line up as a fullback and George Kittle and all mm-hmm. these guys, it's really, really tough. But I think that's the idea with someone like Jalen Lucas and, and ideally what any good offense wants to do is have guys that are versatile, like can play in many different spots. Um, so like you were saying, you know, guys like Nicholas Singleton, even Catron Allen has been a, you know, a pretty good wide receiver, um, certainly out of the backfield. So the more guys you can have like that, the better, the more versatile you can be, the better. And certainly with the way that Penn State uses their tight ends, you know, Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson have lined up all over the field at different points. Um, the better your offense can be and then the better that you can disguise what you're doing compared to, you know, some yeah. other teams that, you know, have to make wholesale changes when they're going to focus on running the ball versus passing the ball. So Jalen Lucas, um, certainly somebody that, that Penn state's going to be, I think hard after, and we'll see if a visit will get set up here in the, in the near future. Well, those are some of the realistic priority targets for Penn state. It's still wide receiver. Number one, first and foremost, we've already discussed some of the, the other players that, uh, that have been involved. Jamar, Jamori Macklin. Uh, I do want to make a correction about Josh Kelly. I had his height wrong. It is six foot one. Uh, and then they're going after guys in the trenches too, Alan Heron and Aeneas Peebles uh, out of out of Duke and uh, Heron, a Division II player. But what about the unris- unrealistic names? Walter, Walter Nolan is in the transfer portal. I think Julian Fleming somewhat does constitute unrealistic, but I, mm-hmm. we're talking all things Julian Fleming here. So let's debate that in the upcoming segment. Let me tell you about one of our sponsors on today's show first, and that is Jace Medical. I I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities in life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. This is scary. I I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if a family member or loved one got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from life-saving medication that they needed. Thankfully, we're all going to be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medica- medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to get prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use promo code Locked On to get $20 off your order. That's jacemedical.com using offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Today's episode is also sponsored by Team Ticker, and everybody can see it on the background. I appreciate everybody joining the live show. For my audio listeners, I'm going to describe it to you. That is a Team Ticker sign right there back to my left, the high-tech retro display sign. 
is a one of a kind sports sign for all you Nittany Lion fans out there. I'm going to go a little bit off script here because as we were getting ready to start this show, Pat and I were uh, wondering what was going on. And this is the first time I've actually seen this. I had this plugged in and ready to go right at the start of tip off for the Penn State basketball game against Maryland. And the, the Penn State fight song started playing out of nowhere as loud as can be. So if you're worried about missing a game, like that's in the script that you will never miss a game. You have a countdown for it. No, you will truly never miss a game as that sign will let you know right at tip off, right at kickoff when the game is going to happen. Plus, you get all the latest on football, men's and women's basketball, baseball, soccer, softball. It provides daily updates for your team as well as schedules, stats, standings, rankings, and so much more. Now, how does it do that? It's a smart sign. There's a mobile app that you can connect easily to your Wi-Fi so that those daily updates are, well, up to date. And it's easy to hang on the wall in a matter of seconds. I had it up and running in no time. It is the ultimate upgrade to your Nittany Lions sports collection. And once you hang it on the wall, you're going to be the talk of all your fellow Penn State fans. If you're looking for that one eye-catching item to showcase your team pride, or a gift this holiday season for that special Nittany Lions fan, go to teamticker.com and pick up your team ticker today. And right now during the holiday season, Team Ticker wants to help you with a $50 discount using promo code locked on over at teamticker.com. So go pick out your sign when you go to checkout. Use promo code locked on for $50 off your purchase this holiday season. Team Ticker, the one of a kind sports sign for all of you Nittany Lion fans out there. And the Locked On Podcast Network is proud of this one, launching the first ever 24-7 national sports streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus the national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. I, I feel like for at, for the transfer portal, there are a lot of quote unquote unrealistic names based on need, based on profile, but Penn state, I, I feel like should be in the running for some of these players. The, the list is very extensive. So how about we start with Julian Fleming? Because he said, well, maybe he's not so un unrealistic in this case, because it came down to Ohio state and Penn state as his top two Penn state ultimately missed out. Penn State seems to have a common theme there where they don't typically get the top wide receiver in state, unfortunately. That that should change. And maybe should let me ask you, should all those wrong decisions back in the day when Fleming committed to Ohio State, can those be fixed this time around if he potentially commits to the Nittany Lions? Potentially. Um, well, okay. I guess first and foremost, I, I don't think like just like any other Penn State fan didn't love like the whole uh, Penn State used Justin Shorter incorrectly his freshman year. So that's why I'm not going there. Like his, his <laughs> excuse just because it was kind of like, well, Justin Shorter, you know, what I think proved to be, you know, fine. He, he ended up you know with a fine career at Florida. I think he, he did get drafted. I don't know if he's on an NFL roster or not though, but um, I also don't think like Julian Fleming was wrong in any of it, right? We look back the last couple of years and I mean, Penn State's been, you know, Jahan Dotson had a good career. I mean, a great career. I shouldn't just say a good career, a great career. Um, yeah. You know, Parker Washington was pretty good, but it was a lot more of even Mitchell Tinsley was, you know, he, he, he did fine as well, but it was less of, you know, the Penn State offense being the exciting offense that when Julian Fleming was a recruit, you know, 2017, that area, um, probably not what he thought he was going to sign up for. So, no, I don't really, you know, hold all that much against him. And and I mean, to be honest, he this is where I come back to with Fleming. <laughs> He's not that good. Like, and 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 I say this as somebody that I would be perfectly fine with him coming to Penn State. I'm not saying he's a bad player, but mm -hmm. as far as like unrealistic, realistic, things like that, he has simply just been a guy at Ohio State. Which is yeah. which is fine, right? He's been a solid wide receiver three for them, but this is not the case of someone who you know um, hasn't had opportunity. He's been a full fledged starter because Jackson yeah. Smith the Jigba missed basically all of last season for the last two years. 2022 yeah. with CJ Stroud, who turns out is a really really good quarterback. Thirty four receptions, five hundred and thirty three yards, six touchdowns. This year as the you know 
number three wide receiver again, and and for some games number two, 26 receptions, 270 yards for only you know 10.4 yards per catch and no touchdowns. Um, I understand that you know starting at Ohio State is 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 impressive, so I'm not saying that he's he's not good, yeah. but this isn't the case of somebody that I would necessarily think you know is going to get a NIL massive NIL bag at USC or Texas mm-hmm. or places like that. Um, yeah. So that's why I think it is realistic that he could potentially come to Penn State, just simply because you know Penn State does have a need for competent wide receivers, which Julian Fleming is. Um, he's a certainly a competent wide receiver. I do think he would help the Penn State wide receiver room, but he doesn't profile necessarily as somebody that's going to come in and have, you know, 60 receptions for a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns and all of a sudden mm-hmm. become a first team uh, all conference yeah. player. I don't, I don't really for- foresee that. Maybe there are other colleges that believe that, but I don't know. I tried to take my, Penn State blue and white glasses off when I was looking at his highlights because of course every Penn mm-hmm. State fan wants that dream story of Fleming comes home and and he becomes an All American and blah 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 blah. Um, yep. I just don't think that's who he really is. He's apparently very well respected within the locker room. You know, a great leader. Everybody at Ohio oh, yeah. State, oh yeah, has said that. Really hard worker, um, dedicated run blocker, which I think that Penn State receiver wide receiving room needs as well. Um, so. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't want him as the only wide receiver or wouldn't even want him necessarily as the second wide receiver. But if he comes in in a three wide receiver transfer class, um, yeah, I would be, I would welcome him with open arms. So um, to answer your question on if he's realistic or unrealistic, I think that he's more realistic than I, than I would have thought just because sure. I don't think that there's going to be, you know, those scary programs of Texas, USC, Oregon, right. The, the, the NIL champions that are going to, you know, put aside something crazy for him. So what do, what do you think? Have you, you know, watched any Fleming tape recently? Cause I was, you know, I was on the YouTube rabbit hole and I don't know. It's just, he, it's, it's tough for me to see somebody who had opportunity at Ohio state and yeah. never took that next step to come here and, and, and do that. That's, I guess where my concern is. So let's, let's frame it this way. Julian Fleming was typically what third, fourth or fifth, normally on the Ohio State totem pole between all the wide receivers that were there, right? Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, Marvin Harrison Jr. Like those guys were naturally going to leap over him if they were ever at any point. And that's the case now going into next year. Brandon Innes, Carnell Tate, they probably had the conversation with him and saying like, look, you're developing as five stars. You're not. And they're probably going to get the lead for targets next year. You got to make a realistic decision. Do you want to compete with them? Or do you want to go try to start fresh somewhere else? And and let, let's put it that way. Same thing with Kyle McCord, right? I can't speak on behalf of both of them, but I imagine the same conversation had it. Look, we weren't impressed with the results. We expected better. There's going to be a competition between the quarterback recruit we have coming in and the available options in the transfer portal. You can stay and compete and possibly ride the bench, or you can go and, and find some place with more security. I anticipate that the same conversation happened both times with McCord and Fleming in this case. So Fleming might have been the fifth or fourth best receiver at Ohio State over his time in Columbus. But I got to say this, Fleming would instantly become the most talented wide receiver at Penn State if he were put on this roster right now. Over Keandre Lambert-Smith, over Trey Wallace, over what, Caden Saunders, any, any of them, Dante Cephas. Julian Fleming would essentially become the number one. Is that more of a reflection of how good Julian Fleming could be? Or is that how lackluster the Penn State wide receiver room is? Let me let me say this about Julian Fleming. I think he was overrated as a high school prospect. Fleming was a little bit on the older side. As I know this story because I've covered Central Pennsylvania high school football and everything else. At, at freshman seven on seven, at, at seven on seven drills, and, at, and as a freshman in high school, he was driving himself to the practices, to the scrimmages. Okay. He was 16 years old, but he was a, a freshman. He was yeah. a man among boys in this case. The competition, Southern Columbia <laughs> is one of the most historic, winningest high school football programs in Pennsylvania for anybody that's watching, listening that is familiar. 
in this case, they run the football very well. They don't typically pass all that often, but in double A, in double A, that that they, there's one single A through six A. Double A is closer, is down below, right, in terms of skill level and competition and everything. It is no wonder that an 18 year old senior, 19 year old senior, going up against high school players at the double A level is going to have the success that he does. So I, I feel like Julian Fleming, I feel like the competition finally caught up to him in this case. And that's why he never really panned out as a five star at Ohio state. Is he a division one? Is he a power five wide receiver? Is he competent? Is he capable? As you said, yes. Would he be, if you put him into the Penn state wide receiver room, would he be the best, most talented player right now at this given second on Wednesday, December 6th? Absolutely. But to think that you're going to get a bargain value here of a five-star that never really panned out, I just don't think he was ever a five-star to begin with. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Man, maybe I'm just like so lost in the sauce. I, I, I don't even know if I would agree with him being the best option at Penn State. Like, I almost I think I'd rather have Cephas and Trey Wallace over Fleming if for next okay. year. For next year. I mean... I'm Again, I'm I, I really don't know. I, maybe I'm completely off base. I do agree with you that I think again he, he was also again it was in a crowded wide receiver room. It's not like Fleming was taking reps as the one. It yeah. was always Wilson, Alave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Marvin Harrison Jr. They always they always moved up into the one spot. It's not like they said, okay, Julian Fleming, you're going to be the X. He was always the third or fourth option in the offense. What would he be like with a Drew Aller? as the number one option. And then you have Keandre Lambert Smith and Trey Wallace as the complimentary pieces with, with an even target yeah. share. I, I, I got to say that he would obviously do better than what he did at Ohio state, just because of the in-house competition. I think, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to. Oh, that's why I, we have these conversations, right? Yeah, that's why I'm we have these to, debates. No, I'm trying to, you know, pick my words wisely here because i you know i can't say that i've watched every single second of julian fleming so it's not you know an extremely strong take but when i watch you know the some of the players that penn state has offered as far as jamori macklin at north you know north texas group of five mm -hmm. and even donovan mccauley um you know Dion burks at purdue antoine wells at south carolina guys like that and compare them to fleming i mean not that fleming is a little below them but i don't know i just Especially, especially this season, he just, I thought separation was a bit of an issue. Um, I think oh, he and, that's pretty, Penn, and that's Penn State's problem too. Wide yeah. receivers don't separate. So great. Now, We're just adding someone else into the fold that can't do that. Now he's a big body, you know, he's six two. Um, I think he's listed two ten, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if he's a little bit bigger than that. And he is good at using his body and making th contested catches and things like that. And I do agree with you that I think a lot of what Ohio State was doing, especially, you know, you look at the Penn State game this year, they were simply just, it was either Marvin Harrison Jr. or Cade Stover as far as the passing game goes, or at least a lot of it. Um, I just, you know, think that for someone like Julian Fleming that, you know, was a five-star, number one kid in his class, and, you know, goes to a place like Ohio State, of course there's competition, but just that it, there just would have been a little bit more um, um, flashes. I'm forgetting the name, the Detroit Lions wide receiver who was at Ohio, who was at Ohio State and then transferred to Alabama. I can't think of his name. Jamison at, Williams. Jamison Williams. Thank you. Right. Yep. Like he was the guy that when he played, like he was actually truly blocked at Ohio State those two years. Right. He didn't get that much mm -hmm. time when he did play. You know, he was catching 80 yard touchdowns and things like that. And he goes to Bama and boom, all of a sudden he's really, really good. Um, I just you know would hope that, and I'm not, I don't think that you're a, necessarily this case, but right, Penn State fans. Basically every single offseason since Julian Fleming has enrolled at Ohio State because it's been since that first year that it hasn't worked out. Every single offseason, it's like, oh, maybe Fleming wants her transfer portal. Um, I would just hope that Penn State fans are aware that it's not five star Fleming. And mm -hmm. in the best case scenario, it's probably not going to be wide receiver one Fleming either, right? He'd be coming here kind of doing similar things to what he was doing at Ohio State. Now, I do think he would see a bigger target share just because Penn State does not have Justin Spencer, Jake, or Marvin Harrison, or players like that. But be um, nice, be nice. It, it would be nice if Marvin Harrison Jr. got NIL deal from Penn State, didn't go to the NFL. Um, I, I just think he would just be more of. I say just the guy, and I'm not saying that like negatively, but he would just be part of 
the group here. Maybe that's, you know, 40 catches. Maybe that's 50 catches. I I, I don't know. But again, I, I would be happy with him coming here. And that's kind of why I do think that he is more realistic than, than maybe, you know, would meet the eye originally with, you know, kind of his background with Penn State and how, at least fan-wise, things went a little sour. I think James Franklin is generally a little bit, you know, smarter with that. And even going back to, man, Fleming, I don't even think Stubblefield was his main recruiter. I think it was Gerard Parker. So, yeah. you know, that's so many, you know, so long ago. And even Parker, I think, was brought in, you know, prior to that, it was Gaddis. So, um, and David Corley. So, you know, yeah, it, it's just a different Penn State. James Franklin is one of the few constants of of that recruitment back then. Um but I would be happy with Fleming to to sum it all up. I feel like we spent a lot of time on Fleming, but um, well, I would but be it, happy with him as long as he's not as long as people aren't thinking that he is going to be the savior, which I don't think that Penn State necessarily would think. Yeah, no, don't like I said, don't think you're getting a bargain value here on a former five star who just needs to break out of his shell. We know yeah. what he is. Don't romanticize that he's going to return to being one of the top wide receivers from the the high school class, but. I, I got to say that he would be, he's comparable to what the talent level at Penn State is right now. I, I think both, I think yeah. both those statements can be true. Both of those statements can be true. And I, I think it takes some pressure because then, you know, Keandre Lambert Smith doesn't have a great game. Okay. Now it opens up other options because it felt like when one was shut down, the entire group was shut down this season. Yeah. So I feel like there's a little more. It, it's an upgrade. It's a bonus. It's a plus if you can get him, but you still need a second target. Let's talk about legitimate, unrealistic names. I think you mentioned Antoine Wells from South Carolina. Juice Wells, I, I figure that's another one that kind of falls into that unrealistic category. Let's talk about the best name to enter into the transfer portal. Walter Nolan has already released his top six. This is more of a conversation about why Penn State is never it never really seems to be in those conversations for just the best overall free agent, right? Regardless of need, regardless of want, because Walter Nolan instantly becomes a starter at Penn State. So and and there is a need at defensive line, whether it's for depth or star power, you need defensive tackles in the Big Ten. So and I think you could throw LT Overton, basically anybody that's entered in from Texas AM, all these former four-star and five-star recruits. Why, why aren't they serious targets for Penn State? Why are we talking about them as unrealistic names, Pat? I think it comes down to, you know, everybody's three favorite letters when it comes to college football, NIL. Uh, Penn State mm. certainly is mm. not. Um, who was it? Uh, Florida State had a defensive end. Patrick Payne entered the transfer portal um, last night, and it basically came out that there were – Failed negotiations, I believe was the term, which kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah, where, Texas A&M too, right. Where, you know, college sports is at this point. But I'm trying mm -hmm. to find the the photo itself. But somebody made up, you know, potential options for Pat P. And it was like Tennessee, Oregon, Texas, USC. Once again, these schools that Miami that have, oh. you know, the influx of NIL and, you know, make it more of a, a focus for themselves as schools um i think it's twofold that penn state one it's just not built out the way that it has been i think you know happy valley united's doing a lot of a lot of good work and it's you know with pat craft in there now and you know james franklin's mm -hmm. talked about alignment and things like that it's getting better but just generally speaking i don't think that penn state necessarily wants to be in the I don't think they want to necessarily just be in the scenario where they just become, you know, come to our school because we are the highest bidder. I personally like how Penn State, you know, mostly does it where, you know, you look at Drew Allure, you look at Nick Singleton, these guys that yeah. come to Penn State, not necessarily prove yourself, but come to Penn State, show that you want to be at the school and that it's not just simply, you know, all about money and, you know, things will take care of itself. And, you know, Drew Allure is certainly making a lot of money. Nick Singleton, I'm sure, is making a lot of money. Um Yep. And I, I think you look around at, you know, Texas A&M is a bit of a unique scenario just because they also did have a coaching change. But, you know, that's a place that every offseason guys are jumping in and out, staying on the team, maybe not staying on the team. Um, so for as beautiful as NIL is and and certainly, you know, Penn State wants to get in a better spot of where they're at and, you know, just to, to be able to, oh, if Walter Nolan jumps in and Penn State really does have a major need at defensive tackle to be able to get someone like that. But um, 
yeah, just simply is not not the game that Penn State uh, can even play if they want it to. But uh, I don't think that they're it's a game that they necessarily want to play all that much. Where it's just simply a highest bidder situation. Which once again, no, no, I have if a kid wants to just go to the highest bidder. By all means, I would I would you know go anywhere that pay me less. It's it's fine. It's financial security for your family. If you get a one million dollar check, there are that's that's nothing too bad an eye at a half a million dollars. Some some high school recruits before they even set foot on college football campuses, Pat, are getting two million dollars up front just for committing, just for signing on the dotted line. That's a different conversation. Uh, for for Penn State, the reality of is, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll simplify it, success with honor. Penn State actually lives by that standard. They're not just going to throw money around at whoever. They want high-character players, high-character players from high-character families as well. And I'm not trying to say that, oh, these players that are in the transfer portal don't fit that category. That's not the case. But there there are a few boxes that Penn State likes to check. One of them is, do we have a prior relationship with you? So that's Mm -hmm. why Julian Fleming actually does make a little bit of sense here because Penn State was essentially his second school. For Walter Nolan, for any of these other guys, they're out of the area. They're on the other side of the country. They uh, don't have exactly the best prior relationship with Penn State and James Franklin. They value that above all else. The reason why Penn State, at least in this cycle, isn't going after like, oh, well, what about these unrealistic names? Because they're all quarterbacks, okay? The, the unrealistic names in the transfer portal that are dominating right now, this is essentially an overload of quarterbacks, whether it's Cam Ward, Dante Moore, Brock Vandergriff, right? Michigan is looking for a quarterback, and Washington and Oregon, right? Because all of those guys are going to graduate or go on to the NFL. Penn State's lucky in the sense that their five-star quarterback is coming back, is returning for at least one more season. So they don't need to be in the conversation for any of those guys because there isn't necessarily a need. So the reason I feel like this list is so short and why it's really relegated to just a couple of guys on the defensive line is because, yes, there's more or less a need there at defensive tackle with what you're potentially losing for Penn State. But outside of wide receivers, there there isn't a super, like a, an absolute superstar wide receiver. There's a lot of good compliments, but uh, and guys that can be number ones at Penn State because of the because of the skill level, but I, I wouldn't say that there's no uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. I think is, is in, in his own category. But what I'm trying to get at Pat, is is the fact yeah. that there isn't a superstar. He's he's a day one starter. All of these guys can be, but I feel like they still need a strong wide receiver room around him. They can't control the defensive game plan entirely. Definitely. And and just to kind of bring it back when it comes to, you know, transfer portal and NIL and this stuff, I think you can, mm-hmm. you can look at Penn state's, you know, locker room as is, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, more players are going to jump in, you know, whether it's because uh, finals are coming up, right. Just finishing out the semester and, and, and yep. taking it day by day with that, or whether it's, they want to play in the bowl game or, you know, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. I have no doubts that, you know, Christian driver and uh, Bacchetta are not going to be the only players to enter the portal, no. but, when you look at Penn State compared to, you know, Ohio State and Texas, I mean, Texas A&M, again, is their own little thing with their coaching situation. But you look at Penn State right. compared to Ohio State's and even Georgia's and place, places like that. Um, with their coaching staffs intact. <laughs> yeah, with their coaching staffs intact. Penn State does a really good job. James Franklin does a really good job of keeping those guys around. And once again, just like we talked about in the last podcast, knock on wood when it comes to, you know, a Katron mm-hmm. Allen or a Abdul Carter or someone like that with this whole – failed negotiation thing but to this point during the nil era penn state has done a really good job of of yeah. keeping the players that they want and even when it comes to like you mentioned those previous relationships with recruitments penn state does such a good job recruiting wise that yeah they lose a guy here or there there was the kid um can't think of his name on top of my head but last year that flipped to florida state the safety that was teammates with with king mac but mm-hmm. by and large somebody commits to penn state and and penn state's usually in a pretty good spot so it's just a credit to James Franklin, what he's looking for in, in these guys. Um, I think it's a credit to, you know, how he's been committed to Penn State and how he's generally, you know, other than offense coordinators, right. pretty committed right. to his coaching staff as well. Um, so that plays a big part in it as well for, you know, I've been frustrated with James Franklin's at, at times and just like any mm-hmm. other Penn State fans, but 
I don't think there's many other cultures that are as strong as, as what James has built in, in State College. And the proof is in what they've been able to build um, during the transfer portal and NIL era, despite not being a, you know, yeah. NIL champion the way that some other schools are. Success with honor. That's what I'll default to. We got one more final segment here, and it's talking about the ongoing staff changes, some of which Penn State, I, this one's not a good one. I'll say that, and Pat, I'm eager to to get your thoughts and to discuss what this means for Penn State as an important recruiting assistant is going over to Syracuse. We'll discuss that in just a moment. Let's hear from another one of our sponsors on today's episode, and that is FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel right now. New customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet, it's that simple. That's 150 bucks if your team simply wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, overs, unders, and so much more. And right now, Penn State, it's moving back and forth, but the Chop Robinson news has brought the spread back a little bit. Three and a half favorite versus Ole Miss with the total moving actually to 49 and a half. If you like those lines, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and keep playing along with college football, the NFL season at FanDuel. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And in this final segment, let's discuss some of the coaching changes. I've already talked about uh, a couple of them. Ola Adams going to Indiana. So maybe Penn State can return the favor by getting a Donovan McCauley and, uh, and a Jalen Lucas to transfer since Ola Adams moves over there to the Hoosiers, but uh, Penn State also hiring uh, Andy Kotelnicki's right-hand man to be an offensive analyst as well. That is Coach Kaiser uh, coming over from Kansas, and he's more of an offensive line, tight ends type of guru here. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, more the merrier, right, to get an influence on two groups that are, are very talented. But this one kind of stings, I, I have to admit. Khalil Ahmad is leaving Penn State to go to Syracuse and reunite with a good friend, a good colleague in Fran Brown. I had a whole podcast devoted to what kind of havoc that Fran Brown would cause coming to Syracuse to be the head coach. And this was one of the consequences of this, being able to pull guys from different staffs that he's had previous great relationships with. What, what, what is, who is Khalil Ahmad for some people that might not be familiar? Well, he's one of the best recruiting uh, specialists on this staff. That is everything that he's devoted to. Ahmad, I would say is responsible for all the success, not all of it, but a lot of the success that Penn state has seen in New Jersey these past few cycles here. So now He's moving to to Syracuse, probably to take on at least a comparable role. Maybe uh, he probably gets a raise. I, I would imagine if he's going to take this job, it's not just about the relationship he has with Coach Brown. It's about getting a raise, uh, an increase in status as well. But he was one of the better, if not the best recruiter on staff for the guy solely devoted to that part of James Franklin's program. Yeah, um, just to answer your question. So he's at Penn State. He was... I'm trying to make sure I have it recruiting coordinator for personal recruitment. Um, and this is according to uh, Emily Liker mm -hmm. of Syracuse.com. He'll be the executive director of personal recruiting. So basically jumping from coordinator to executive director, which if you yeah. work in corporate it's America, a, a coordinator going to be executive director, those are two very drastic uh, differences when it comes to salary. And certainly when it comes to, um, you know, significance and importance and, and things that you're doing. So definitely an upgrade for him as far as, you know, job title and things like that. Yeah. Syracuse, I mean, Fran Brown, they get Elijah Robinson, the, uh, you know, former Penn State player and former Penn State GA that was the defensive line coach at Texas A&M. He was going to Syracuse to become the defensive coordinator. A um, right. bunch of Texas A&M guys jumped in the portal today. If it, uh, for those that followed recruiting in the past, Fidel Diggs who was a defensive end from Camden, which is where Elijah Robinson's from. He jumps in the portal. Um, we'll see if he lands at Syracuse. If if Elijah Robinson somehow gets him to fall into Syracuse, I mean, hats off. But Fran Brown, Elijah Robinson, now hi hiring uh, Khalil Ahmad, 
they are going to i don't like this i don't the, like it at all the bejeebies off at syracuse now here's a th- here's here's why i will push back i don't expect syracuse to so much impact like this isn't that bad for for penn state there might be a guy, maybe two, maybe, you know, you look at someone like Josiah Brown, who's in the class right now, who yeah. was, you know, high three star, low four star, um, fortunately towards ACL, but yeah, maybe they're able to talk that type of kid and not saying Josiah Brown himself, but that type of kid. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it might affect Penn State a little bit. If you're Pitt, if you're Rutgers, if you're Maryland, if you're yeah. Boston College, this is an absolute disaster hire because fran brown elijah robinson by themselves are gonna you know recruit they will torment well. they will torment them in new jersey um and with khalil ahmad coming in to you know be basically the head of, of recruiting the same way that penn state you know they have like um andy frank and kenny sanders and guys like Jack, justin mm-hmm. king back in the day uh yeah they're gonna cause a lot of issues in the northeast but specifically within new jersey because can fran brown's from camden um Elijah Robinson's from Camden, and then Khalil Ahmad, I believe this is from North Jersey, which is where you get like your Don Bosco preps and Paramus Catholics yeah. and places like yeah. that, where Rashawn Gary and Jarrell Preppers and players yeah. like that played. So I expect Syracuse to be more of an issue for, you know, those lower end Northeast schools, again, the Maryland's, um, Boston Colleges, places like that, mm-hmm. more than Penn State. But they're certainly, you know, I think that Syracuse is going to pop up for a guy here or there for Penn State. Certainly more than we've seen in the past. I'm trying to That's think what I'm the saying. Guy. Yeah. yeah, Penn State for really dedicated, you know, those of us that have been following Penn State recruiting for a while. E. Shaq Williams back in like the class of 2011 was a borderline five star, maybe a five star mm. that Syracuse was super involved with. Thomas Hawley back in the day. So, yeah, Penn State and Syracuse did not cross paths all that often with the type of player they were getting. But I feel like, you know, Fran Brown and Elijah Robinson will at least have their foot in the door with these guys. So, yeah. yeah. And that and that's my point. It's not going to nuke. Penn State recruiting, but it's certainly going to turn up the heat here because, and I'll give a a very vague example, but Jalen Matthews was formally committed to Penn State's class of 2025. He's not, Penn State's still in his top, in his uh, top group of schools, but he's entertaining Rutgers and Texas and Georgia. And that makes sense because he's one of the best tackles in all of the country. But then I said, and then Jalen posted about Syracuse and saying, you know, hey, I'm interested in them as well. And I said, look at the impact that it's, you know, that Fran Brown is already having. And he reposted that. So he agrees. So if the five star top offensive tackle in the nation agrees with my crazy thoughts about Fran Brown, uh, possibly just tipping the scales a little bit uh, away from the Northeastern powerhouses of recruiting. Yeah, that that is very true. So uh, is it an extreme that every single Penn State commit is going to flip to Syracuse? No, because Syracuse lacks in NIL. Syracuse lacks in facilities. Penn State is actually better than Syracuse in those categories, which is still a win for them. But will Fran Brown probably flip a couple of four stars here and there and be a little bit of thorn in the side of James Franklin and Penn State? Absolutely. I will say to end it on a positive, though, Elijah Robinson, you know, is a guy in Penn State lore of any time yeah. defensive line job opened. It was always, you know, Elijah Robinson. And and even when Manny Diaz got hired as defensive coordinator, there was a lot of Elijah Robinson buzz um as well so to end on you know a positive note of spinning this why it's a good thing for penn state i do like the idea of elijah robinson going to syracuse getting his feet wet as a defense coordinator because if he's a guy in we'll see what happens with manny diaz and duke that's situation is getting a little yeah not great right now um but right if manny diaz can stay around a year you know maybe two more years and elijah robinson can show at syracuse not only as a recruiter because i don't think anyone doubts that if elijah can say that he would recruit tremendously well but you know mm-hmm. as a defense coordinator um if he can prove that he he can do it in game there's your hopeful you know future penn state defense coordinator so he and james franklin definitely have a good relationship i think that much is is obvious so um always good when they you know go somewhere that Hopefully won't hurt Penn State. I don't think Syracuse will hurt them too much as far as recruiting and things like that. But yeah. like you said, just a bit of a nuisance. You know, they're gonna have to fight a little bit harder for certain guys. So we'll see what happens. But I mean, Fran Brown has been described as the best overall recruiter uh, in the nation. So just take that what you that's not that's not just one or two uh, people in the college football stratosphere. There's a lot of people that back that up and say that Fran Brown at a minimum is top three in terms Did of you individual see his, recruiters. Uh, his press conference because it was very it was good i mean he's you know mm-hmm. obviously speaks for itself but he was like how he's here for life you know he's at syracuse for well, life 
And then I did, like, I did not see those comments, but yeah, whoa. Well, then two minutes later, he said that he his when his daughter turns twelve, he's he's done coaching, and his daughter's like oh. three. So I oh. I don't know what that <laughs> I don't know what that means. He also said that money, you know, he he you know, is from Camden, mm-hmm. which is a rougher area, and that you know, you know, he's already set financially, he's fine. But then also yeah. said that the reason he left Georgia for Syracuse was money. So it's like, uh, okay. I don't know. I was just. <laughs> Is like, Fran, just be, be a little bit more consistent with what we're going with here. Either you're staying here for life and money doesn't matter or money does matter and you're going to be out in nine years. But uh, really good hire for, for Syracuse. Yeah, I think I think he'll operate the way that you need to in this age of college football with the okay. you need to be a CEO. You don't you you don't need to be a true head coach X's and O's head coach to be successful. I, I know some people might debate that with me. That's fine. And that's for another conversation because we're going to wrap it up here, Pat. But I, I think that Fran Brown is going to operate more as a CEO elements of what James Franklin likes to do, because that is what will succeed at, at Syracuse in this case. And I think he'll let the other people, the X's and O's guys do their jobs and, and that's where they will lead to success. But Pat, I always appreciate the conversations. Uh, we'll see what Manny Diaz decides to do. We'll see if anybody uh, commits very soon, but Penn state does. I don't think they kick the can down the road, but they certainly take the time to reestablish and certainly build new relationships with anybody that's in the transfer portal. So these situations are going to be fluid here and I can't wait to have that next discussion with you. Yeah. Thank you. As always, Zach, um, always great to come on and, and, you know, go almost an hour where we talk about Julian yep. Fleming and Fran Brown. Yep. So Penn State yep. podcast. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you everyone go check out black diaries.com where Pat contributes uh, follow them on X Twitter, if you still call it that, and you can st- uh, keep up with the show here on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast, be coming every day, and we'll have more Penn State football content for you, transfer portal content here on Locked On Nittany Lions.